Jesus, welcome to our service this morning. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak in your brokenness church. We want to welcome you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, my name is Jeff DeYoung and I'm the lead pastor of Hillsborough Baptist Church and of the Albert County Network, a group of churches working together to plant a new church down in Alma. Uh, we have a number of announcements this morning I want to draw to your attention. First off, we have connection cards in the seat pockets in front of you. Uh, if you're visiting, we'd love to have a record of your visit. And also you can put prayer requests on those cards and they can go in the offering plate or in the boxes on the back wall of the church. A number of things coming up. We have the Global Leadership Summit, uh, August 9th and 10th. Uh, today is pretty much your last chance to let us know if you'd like to go to that. The cost is $99, and it's an amazing two days of learning and education. And the good news is, even if you can't go for the whole two days, the first Thursday, the 9th, uh, the morning is free. They've changed that so that it's free. You can go t get a taste of the summit. Uh, that morning, it's at Hillside Baptist Church uh, in Moncton. Uh, small groups continue on Monday nights here at the church at 7 p.m. on Culture and the Bible. You're invited to that. And also don't forget about Oasis coming up. Our annual gathering of Atlantic Baptists uh, will be in Wolfville this year, and that's from August 23rd to 25th. If you'd like more information, uh, please contact the office. Uh, Guatemala mission trip. We've still uh, got some room for some more people to go along on that. Uh, that's going to be in January 15th to 25th, and you can speak to Richard and Kathy, or I believe Elaine Steves, if you'd like more information on that. Uh, two other quick things uh, noticed out there on the front uh, in the foyer. Uh, there's two vacation Bible school programs going to be running uh, from August, where are we here? August 12th to 17th. Um, at Salem Baptist Church in the evenings, and also August 13th to 17th at the Valley Church. So if you have little ones or you know somebody with little ones, please, please spread the word. Uh, let them know they can go to Salem or the Valley that week and enjoy a great vacation Bible school program. And they're doing two, two, two different programs, so if you think, well, I'd like to try this one or that one, you have the opportunity to do that. That's all our announcements this morning. Let me invite you to stand for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this opportunity to gather. Lord, we thank you for the rain that refreshes the land, and we pray, Lord, that your spirit 
and come down on us and refresh us this morning. Father, bless us as your church. Allow us to honor you with our praise and to give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to greet one another. All right, as you make your way back to your seats, we're going to sing 10,000 Reasons this morning. There are so many reasons that we have to glorify God, to bless Him, to say thank you to Him this morning.
alone that we stand and on his cornerstone we can remain firm and I am so so grateful this morning that in Christ alone is where our hope is found where our strength is taken from where our foundation is built Calls me home here in the 
power of Christ, I'll stand. Pray with me, church, this morning. Dear God, it is in you. It is in your power that we can stand here today, that we can say there is no power of hell that can take us from you. Lord God, I am so thankful for your love, your amazing love this morning, and your foundation that we can stand on in the midst of the droughts and the storms. God, you are there, and you are always there. And Lord God, I thank you so much for that. It is in your power that we stand today and in your hope that we are found. God, I pray this morning that we are able to spread our stories of hope because of you. In your name I pray, amen. We'll sing, we'll stand and sing just one more song. It's called Cornerstone. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
Amen, amen. He is Lord. This time I'll invite our ushers forward for a morning offering. I want to say welcome to those who are visiting with us, and please don't feel any obligation to give. This is our opportunity together to support the work of God's church here in Hillsborough and Albert County, and so thank you for being with us. We're glad you are here. Just listening to the songs as we're singing and thinking about the number of places in the world that this morning there'll be worship taking place. People giving God their praise. And there's places in the world, my friends, where it'll be a really, really big deal for them to even raise their voices, let alone have instruments, let alone have young people standing up to sing with them and lead a service. There's places in the world where they have to meet in secret. There's places in the world where when they give, they have to be careful how they give and how they use that money because it's tracked by their government and they could come under accusation and an attack. We take so for granted our freedom to worship, our freedom to give to the Lord and to serve Him, to gather. My friends, as we give these gifts this morning, let them not be something we take for granted, but let us give thanks to God that He has enabled us to give and given us a place to live where we are free to do so, to honor Him with what we have. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful this morning. We are so grateful. We give you thanks because you've done all that's necessary. You've given us freedom. You've given us a, a great country we're part of. And Lord, even as we pray for our country, we recognize that because of that freedom, we can come together this morning. Because of that freedom, we can celebrate your name. And because of that freedom, we can serve and work and earn and give to the cause of Christ. Lord, help us never to take it for granted but to honor you with all that we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a joy to honor him in all we do, in giving, in living life. Amazing love, how can it be that he would die for me? Not forgiven Cause you were forsaken when I'm accepted you were condemned when I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again when I'm forgiven because you were forsaken well, I'm accepted, you were condemned. Well, I'm alive and well, the Spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for
Amen, amen. This time our children can go to junior, to Hills Church, Junior Church. And I'd like to invite Dean and Louise to come up. We're quite excited to, uh, to once again be uh, sending Dean and Louise out. These folks, I think you said, Dean, it's, this is going to be your fifth trip, will this be? Fifth trip, they're going to the Czech Republic again and um, going to be uh, doing some work there. And we wanted to take a moment this morning just to give them a chance to explain a bit about what they're going to be doing. So uh, Dean even gave me questions so I can stay on track. So hopefully we can do that. So uh, could you explain to the folks this morning, why are you going? I'll let Louise answer that. Okay. We're going because we've been invited. It's not Macedonian call. Um, Bedford Baptist, the group that we're going with, um, this is their, their fifth time for doing a summer camp. And um, this time they needed some, some help. And so uh, everyone actually who went from this church last year uh, was invited to, to help out Bedford. And mm. I guess we're going because we've been invited and we're available. Awesome. And uh, just our, our love for uh, the Red Church there and Lenamajitse and, and for the people. Uh, they might be singing in a different language, they might be praying in their own language, but God is present. Mm -hmm. So why the Czech and not somewhere else? Well, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> we have had a connection with the Czech for over 15 years because initially the Carters from our mm. church here became uh, involved in the Czech and invited us to send a team. And so we sent our first team in 2006. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, and I keep saying this, the Czech is the most non-religious country in the world. Yeah. Not even North Korea is as non-religious as the Czech. That doesn't mean they're not a lovely and fine people. They really are. Mm. But, you know, for example, eight, between 18 and 35 years of age, 95% would say they have absolutely no religious affiliation of any kind. Wow. Not Christian, not Jewish, not Muslim, not Buddhist, you name it. So yeah. how do you reach a people... Uh, like that. Well, the church there for over 15 years has been providing English language classes because many Czechs are really anxious to learn uh, English so they can communicate on the internet, in business, and travel. And uh, so uh, we've had, uh, they've had a lot of strong response uh, over the years from that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Louise, how do you see God working in this situation? Well, uh, anyone who has worked at a camp um, and a Christian team gather and uh, start doing all those hard jobs that have to be done, um, there's a bond that forms. Uh, these uh, checks, uh, they just can't understand why these crazy Canadians come, uh, pay their own way, take vacation time, do all these things, uh, the time and preparation. So they're... A lot of Canadians don't either. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. Anyway, and, and as we work and plan, there's a lot of laughter, joy, all that, and team after team, they'll say, well, what is this? There's something, something here. Well, we know what it is. It's the bond of the spirit and of Christian mm. love and all that. But, um, so they're drawn to that. Sure. And um, usually mm. a few weeks after, days after, those people come to the Lord. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. So how can we partner with you? Well... I want you folks all to know that any ministry by anyone here in this congregation is a ministry of this church. That's right. Do you understand that? Because we're partners in the gospel together. Mm. So we're just two members of this church who are going to the Czech Republic. And so we're simply part of your ministry. And one of the reasons why we felt so blessed and saw God moving in such a, an amazing way uh, last June, a uh, year ago June, was because I know you people were praying more earnestly than maybe before any teams, and I know the Czech church uh, was praying. So um, we thank you for that partnership, and we pray that you'll be praying for us and the, and the bed, rest of the Bedford team, and for open hearts uh, for the Czech people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to invite anyone from our mission team that's here to come up, and we want to take a moment just to pray for Dean and Louise this morning. Would you folks please stand as we commission them to go? They're leaving this week. We need to be praying for traveling mercies and for impact and for rest. Uh, they're going to have a very, very busy time as they're there. So 
just to, if you're comfortable, if you didn't, wouldn't mind, just to pray and extend your hand towards them, and we're going to ask God's blessing. Father, we are so truly grateful this morning for what you are doing, Lord. We're grateful for the commissioning of these two followers of Jesus in serving. And we pray, Lord, that you would just absolutely bless them as they go. Remind us all of what it means to be a blessing. And, Father, that when we serve you, that's where we experience the greatest part of the joy, the greatest part of the hope that we have. Lord, guard them as they travel. Guide them as they interact with the Czech people. Lord, we pray that you prepare their hearts now for what you are going to do in their midst. Thank you, Lord, for Dean and Louise. Thank you for their heart for this place and their heart for the Czech Republic. And Lord, do what only you can do. Build your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer together this morning. God, again, we give you thanks. Lord, every time we see some of our own going out, Father, we give you thanks. This is what we are all called to do. We are people who are called to go. We're called to come to Christ, and then he sends us out again to share this good news, that there is hope. There is help, there's healing, all available through Jesus, through his great name, through his finished work on the cross. Lord, this morning we pray once again that even as we've commissioned Dean Louise, that you would commission each of us to, to go into the parts of this community and this region that you've called us to, Lord. We, we pray you'd commission us as we go into our workplaces, Father, to bring the good news. That you commission us as we go into our schools to bring the good news that you would commission us as we go into the grocery stores and the restaurants to bring good news. Father, because you have given us the greatest news, that you so love the world, that you gave your only son so whoever believes would never die but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for this opportunity this morning to come together and be encouraged in the presence of one another in your spirit. Father, we thank you that we are able to come into your presence and bring you our concerns, our requests. Lord, we do continue to pray for strength and healing. Lord, there are many in our midst that still grieve over losses in their life. Father, I think of those even, Lord, we take it lightly sometimes, but grief is grief. And I think about those I've heard in the last little while that have lost beloved pets, Lord. And Father, just as we love our family and friends. So, Father, we, we develop a bond of love, and it's not so much about who we lost, it's about how we feel when we lose. And God, you know that your own son wept when he lost his friend Lazarus. Father, allow us to share our tears and sorrow that they might be relieved. Allow us to share our joy that they might be multiplied. Allow us to celebrate who you are and what you've done. Lord, I think about this past Thursday night in so many ways that were shared about how you are working. And God, we give you thanks that you are healing, that you are strengthening, that you are encouraging. Father, I think about those struggling with addiction. Father, we pray for deliverance from that bondage. We pray for those struggling with mental health issues. And God, that you would comfort and give peace. And, and Father, in the, in the midst of those times when we cannot see the light, Father, remind us, remind us that you are light that you've given us your light and through Jesus Christ. We cling to you, Lord, in dark times. We cling to you when we have needs, and we trust you for all of them. We surrender our worries to you, Lord, this morning. Father, some of us have been so used to trying to control our lives, we struggle with the idea of giving up control. And I pray you'd help us to see that the truth is that you are loving and almighty and good God. You are in control. Thank you, Father, that we can trust you in all circumstances, that we can give you thanks in all circumstances. And we pray that you'd allow us, Lord, to see, even in the midst of the darkest places, that you are the good shepherd, that you will guide us, you will lead us, you will make us lie down. And Father, give us rest. We pray for that rest this morning. We pray that uh, for the many that are away here in the summertime, Lord, that they would gain the rest they need and come uh, back to your family restored and refreshed and ready to serve. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, once again, my name is Jeff DeYoung, and for the sake of those watching, we say welcome, good morning to the Tide, and uh, to those who watch us online, we know many people will check us out online first, and we want to say welcome, thank you for watching. One of the most uncomfortable things to talk about when you've been married for almost 28 years is your ex-girlfriends. So I thought I'd start there this morning. <laughs> I love the looks on my wife's face when I do stuff like that. 28 years this August. Can you believe it, babe? She's still shaking her head. Uh, I want to talk about my ex-girlfriend because some of you have practiced this. Some of you maybe experienced this. Have you ever heard of dating evangelism? You know what I'm talking about? That's when you're, you're going out with somebody who's not a Christian. You think, I should bring them to church. And, and so when I was dating my first girlfriend, her name was Lisa, I thought I should bring her to church. Stop that, hon. I thought I should bring that to her to church. And, and, and so I brought her to church for the first time, and she had never been to church in her life. And, and this was back in the you know, mid-1980s, so that was, that was fairly uncommon then. Do you, I, I want to say this. Do you folks realize how common that is now? There's a huge group of people in our culture, right in our community of Hillsborough, who have never darkened the door of any church. They, they don't know why we do what we do or what we're talking about. They don't know when to stand up or sit down. And they definitely don't know what to do when we come to this table that's laid before you this morning. Wow, they're passing notes in class now. <laughs> Anyway, so I brought Lisa to church that, that particular Sunday, and it had taken me a little while to get up the courage. See, I grew up in church. To me, going to church was normal. Everything we do is normal. When we stand, when we sit, that we bow our heads, close our eyes, fold our hands, it's all normal. And so I didn't think anything. It didn't even, I didn't even bat an eye to see the communion table set up. We call this the communion table or the Lord's table. And I didn't think anything of it. She's just sitting there beside me, and I'm, I'm busy whispering in her ear, okay, we're going to stand now, we're going to sit now. This is where we close our eyes, and she's trying to follow my lead and do what I'm telling her to do. And then the pastor gets up and starts to explain this stuff. And, and the pastor starts with, we've gathered here today to partake of, to eat the body of Christ and to drink his blood. Now we've heard those words so many times, it doesn't even occur to us that that's a little weird. Do you know the early church as it formed and began to obey Jesus Christ in communion, they were accused of being cannibals. Did you know that? And for a society that already looks at us with some uh, questions, if not outright suspicion, it's important that we actually explain not just what we're doing, but why do we do it? We often forget to do this. We often forget to educate people. And, and this poor girl, I mean, she, she hears these words come out of the pastor's mouth, and, and the look she gave me, I, I can't duplicate it. I cannot duplicate it. But it's a look of horror, okay? Shock and awe. Like, what? <laughs> I'm trying to explain. Well, it's a symbol. It, it's, it, just, just do it, okay? That's not the right way to handle such an important part of our church life, is it? It's so critical. I still remember, and I think I always will, when I, when I first uh, became a deacon in my home church and the first time I got the chance to sit and help serve communion, and it was profoundly impactful. And unfortunately, I was a little bit distracted that day because in our particular church, uh, they only had men sitting up there at the time. And, and it happened to be an evening service, and I'd forgotten it was communion. Some of you deacons know what I'm talking about. I'd forgotten it was communion. And so I showed up and they said, yeah, you're on for communion tonight. And I was just wearing like, you know, a nice short sleeve collared shirt and slacks. And every other guy was in a three-piece suit. You know, you remember that old Sesame Street song, one of these things is not like the other? <laughs> I, was, I was so stuck on that I didn't fit that I had a hard time paying attention. And, and you know, we can feel that way sometimes, like we don't fit. Like maybe, you know, this isn't a good time for me or I'm not really sure whether I should take it. And this is when I became a pastor, the very first time I led communion, and, and again, I just was overwhelmed with how inadequate I was and how unworthy I was to serve, never mind take part in what we call the Lord's Supper of Communion. And it occurs to me that whether you've been following Jesus Christ for a long time, or you're fairly new to following Christ, or maybe you haven't decided whether you're even, you know, interested in following Jesus, that if we're going to have this in front of you, that you should be aware of and have an explanation for what it is all about. 
And maybe for those of you that have done it for a long time, we need to be reminded how important, how critical, how serious it is to partake in the Lord's Supper, this thing we call communion. I want to distill it down for you this morning if I can because there's lots of questions we could ask about communion. We could do all the, the usual questions. We could do who, what, where, when, why, and how. We could do all that stuff. But I think sometimes those questions become a distraction from what Jesus intended to do in the first place. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Luke 22 with me and look at this, this description, this story once again of Jesus on that night what he went through, what he did, and how he was feeling about the situation. And maybe that'll give us a little more clarity and help us to remember why this is so important that we gather. Because I think our questions are interesting. Some of the questions are even important, but most of the questions we have, we could be answered one-on-one. -on -one. What's critical for us as a body is to remember that the primary point is Jesus is offering his disciples something brand new. He's offering them a new covenant. He's changing everything that was and deciding and declaring what will be. He's giving us a new promise that, that is offered to us, not just his disciples at that time. And he's saying so clearly, trust me, put your faith in me, and I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free from your sin, from your failures and mistakes. I'm going to set you free from death itself. And what's so exciting to me is what he says in this first opening few verses. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. We know this. In that day, in those days, they didn't sit on comfortable chairs like we have here. They actually had more of a lounger. And they would recline with one arm like this and be able to reach in and grab the food. And so their feet would be away from the table and their head towards the table. It says, he says this to them, and we miss this. We always go jump right to talking about the bread and the cup. But my friends, listen to the words of Jesus. He says to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Here's what I want you to notice. I really want you to notice this. Jesus wanted this time with his friends. He didn't just do it to create a new ritual. He didn't do it because he thought, I need something for them to be religious about. Jesus wanted to do this. He earnestly desired to spend this time with, with his disciples. And you have to understand, because we usually don't, and, or, and or we've forgotten, where this whole meal came from. It's based on the original feast of Passover that the Jewish people celebrated. For Jesus to say, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, is a recognition that this was a celebration feast in the same way we celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas. This was an opportunity for friends and family to come together and to share a meal and to celebrate who God is and what he's done. It was an important, critical feast in the Jewish year. Now saying that, we need to understand that no one looked forward to the very first Passover. If you were to take the time to look at the Old Testament story of the Passover, the, the Israelite people were in slavery in Egypt. They, they, God had already sent nine different plagues on Egypt to try and persuade the Pharaoh to set my people free, let my people go. And God had then declared through Moses, I'm going to send a tenth plague, a Passover. The angel of death will pass over and the firstborn will die. And the Jewish people, you can imagine their fear. He says, listen, here's what you got to do. You need to sacrifice a lamb. And that, that lamb who can have no bone broken, the blood will be put on the door frame of your house. And if there's no blood, the firstborn in that house will die. Imagine how God's people felt being told that the angel of death was going to pass over. Not he might, but he was going to. And that the only way he would pass over their house and not stop there, not bring that plague upon them was if they had done what God had told them to do, if they'd been obedient and partaken of that sacrifice. It was not a comfortable scene. It was a scene that, that was rife with urgency. In fact, in Exodus 12, the very first time they were commanded to eat this sacrifice, they were, it says this in Exodus 12, verse 11, it says, in this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Do it quick, because when it's done, you're going to have to go on a journey. This is wolf it down. It's time to go. I'm going to set you free. There's this incredible urgency to it, but there's also another piece. Because the first uh, Passover, as an example of God's power, was profound, but something changed every Passover since then. 
You see, slaves were not allowed to sit when they ate. Slaves were not allowed to sit down when they ate. Which meant when God says, put on your belt, put on your sandals, grab your staff, be ready for the journey. He says, you're going to eat this meal and then you're going on a journey. But from now on, you'll be allowed to sit when you eat or even recline. So when we see Jesus reclining at a table, it's a declaration that the Jewish people made every, every Passover, every year, that we are free. We are free. And Jesus, in that Passover, that, that night when he gathered with his disciples, before he was betrayed, with his betrayer still at the table, says, what I want more than anything is to eat this with you. I want to share this time with you. I want to be with you. He is so profoundly in love with you that he wants to do this for you. It's an intimate moment with his friends, and he wants that moment so, so badly. And so he tells them, this is so important to me. This is the last thing I'm going to do before I suffer. This is, he could have done anything that last night. He could have gone for a walk. He could have gone hang out with somebody else. He could have gone visit his friend Lazarus and Mary and Martha. But he chose to come to the table and to celebrate one last Passover meal. And what strikes me as strange, and it should strike you as strange when you think about what's coming next, because most of us know the story, but in case you don't, after the supper, he's going to go to the garden. In the garden, he's going to pray. And then his ex-friend Judas, who becomes a traitor, is going to come, and he's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried, thrown in jail. And the next day, he will go to the cross. And he will die for your sins and mine. That's what's coming, and Jesus knows it's coming. So it should shock you when you see what happens next. Luke 22, verse 17 says, And he took a cup, and when he given thanks, do you notice that? He knows what's coming next, and yet he still gives thanks. That's jarring, isn't it? Have any of you ever experienced difficulty in your life? Have any of you ever known something bad was coming that you could not get away from? You knew, either you, you know, if you're a kid, maybe you knew, I'm in trouble, mom and dad have found out, I'm just waiting for the punishment. Or maybe you knew that you were about to lose your job, or maybe you knew that the doctor was about to give you bad news. And you thought, how in the world can I obey the scripture when it says give thanks in all circumstances, my friends? On the night he was to be betrayed, Jesus gave thanks. That doesn't tell us what he gave thanks for. It doesn't say if he gave thanks for the cup they're about to share. It doesn't say if they give thanks for the friends in the room. If he gave thanks to his father, it doesn't say why he gave thanks. It doesn't say if he gave thanks for the traitor sitting there. In fact, he knew he was there to accomplish the will of his father, and he knew a traitor was necessary. Maybe he gave thanks for Judas. We don't know why he gave thanks. But we know that he says, I won't drink again until the kingdom of God comes. He says, I'm not going to have this meal again. I'm not going to eat again. I'm not going to drink again. There's a repetition happening there. That Jesus wants to be clear, something's about to change forever. And he gives thanks in that moment. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, Jeff. When we do communion, we always have the bread first and then the cup. Again, we don't understand how the Passover meal works. In the traditional Passover meal for the Jews, there's actually four cups. And so this is probably the first cup of that meal when he, has, when he gives thanks and he shares that among them. We only have the bread and the cup that we do just once. But when we think about Paul in Thessalonians telling us to pray without ceasing, rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances, Think about Jesus who on that night gave thanks. He wanted so badly to spend the time with his friends, he gave thanks. I believe he gave thanks for them and he gave thanks for you and I. Because he knew that what was going to happen was going to change our fate. Scripture says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And so he did what was necessary and he gives thanks, Jesus does, because he knows that this is necessary. Again, how often would we be thankful if we knew what was coming? Maybe more. Maybe less. So what about the bread and the cup? What about them? 
Well, it says in verse 19 that he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, again, there's things we take for granted. Do you know what rich people in Jesus' day did with bread? They cut it. They didn't break it. But poor people didn't usually have fancy knives. They didn't have all the tools that rich people had. In fact, when they got a loaf of bread, they'd usually just snap it in half and start eating. Jesus and his followers were not wealthy. But when he broke the bread, I've been guilty of this and many pastors have, we say the words, this is Jesus' body broken for you. But his body was not broken. Not one bone. It's important because the command for the Passover lamb, Jesus is becoming that Passover lamb. The scriptures are clear that not one bone of the lamb can be broken. He is nailed to a cross. He is beaten and his side is pierced with a spear, but not one bone is broken. And so we correctly say, this is, my, this is his body given for you. The symbol is one of surrender, of sacrifice. You can't keep the bread. Once you break it, you've got to eat it. Understand what Jesus is doing. He's offering himself. He is God. And he's saying as an act of love, when we think about how much he wanted to spend this time with us, how much he gave thanks for us, and what he's saying is really this, I'm not willing to live without you. When we take this supper, when we remember him, Jesus Christ said, I'm not willing to live without you. I'm not willing to go one more day separated from you. I will do what's necessary so I can know you and you can know me and I can love you and you can love me and we can walk through this life together and what's more, I'm going to save you from death itself. Jesus Christ did this for us. And he declares it so clearly. And with the cup, it says, likewise, the cup, likewise, did it the same way. He gives thanks again. He gives thanks, he gives thanks, he gives thanks. In, all, in this whole service and time together, he gives thanks. Likewise, the cup after they'd eaten saying, this cup, you can imagine him taking the pitcher of wine and the big goblet and pouring the wine into the goblet. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. God had made a covenant with Abraham said, I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to give you this land. And he had done that. He brought Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, back to Israel. And now Jesus declares, listen, it's time for a new covenant. It's no longer enough just to have one people. I want all people. And so he pours himself out. He delivers us from our old life, from the sins of the past and from the bondage we're enslaved by. And that's why we do what we do. Because Jesus said, remember. And here's what I want you to remember today. When you come to communion each and every time, I want you to remember that he wants to spend this time with you. Jesus Christ wants to spend this time with you. What's more, he gives thanks. He gives thanks for you. He gives thanks for, for the fact that what he did was enough for each and every one of us. And he invites you as you partake and come into communion with him and each other to choose to serve as he did, to lay down your life for those others that need to know the good news too. Remember, remember, remember. He wants to spend this time with you. Give thanks for what he has done and choose to serve as he served. Let's come to the table together this morning and invite our deacons to come. As we share in this time, I invite you to remember. Let's pray together. Father, even as the deacons come, I pray that you would allow us each to remember how much, how much you wanted to spend this time with us that we would give thanks to you, our mighty God, 
for what you've done and for this opportunity to remember that the bread and the cup represent Jesus' body and his blood. Father, we give you thanks for the miracle of your sacrifice of your son. Lord, we know it was necessary because our sin was so overwhelming that the only way to pay for it is death. One had to die and Jesus died in our place and we give you thanks. Thank you as we come. Allow us to remember and to celebrate even as we take this oh so seriously how much you love us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing, open the eyes of my heart together. seated. Part of our custom at the communion service is to take up a benevolent offering for the needs of those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And we're going to ask the deacons at this time if they would prepare to take that. If you prepare to give, uh, these gifts go straight to those who need them most. And we make that a priority as a church to bless our community in that way. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the blessing you've poured out upon us, for this opportunity to give back to those who are in need. Father, we pray that you would lay a spirit of generosity on us and that you would at the same time multiply what is given to be used wisely and effectively to make a difference in the lives of others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are loved Bring light to the darkness you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. 
And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So as we come to this table, we invite all those who have chosen to put their faith in Jesus Christ to take part. Young and old alike, the requirement is that you're willing to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. To celebrate it. And to, with all honor, treat him with the respect he deserves for his great gift. On that night, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. And ask Tyler to give thanks for the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here this morning, to sit at your table, to remember what you have done for us. Lord, let's not misunderstand what was done for, you, for us, though, Lord. Help us remember that you weren't murdered, you weren't taken, that you freely gave yourself up for us. Help us to remember the gift that you have given us, Christ. We serve each other because Christ served us. This is his body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him.
Imagine Jesus pouring the wine from the chalice into the cup. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Bless Greg to give thanks for the cup of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for your sending your son to, to earth to be sacrificed for our sin. It's said that he came to earth to be more like us so that he could teach us to be more like him. We thank you for uh, this act and we thank you for this ceremony that we're given to remember your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus' blood poured out for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. And after the supper, the scriptures record that they sang a hymn and went out. So I invite you to stand as we close together.
in every moment how much you wanted us. You were not willing that any should perish. So you sent your son. And Father, he demonstrated his great love for us when we were still your enemies. Lord, thank you that we are no longer aliens, strangers, or enemies of you. But through Christ, through what he did, his body given, his blood poured out. He paid so that we can come if we put our faith in him. Father, we repent. We turn from our ways of a past and we turn towards you this morning. We ask that you'd send us out missionaries to a world that needs hope, aware of the truth of how much you want them to, how you give thanks for the very ones that sometimes we struggle with and how you've called us to serve them as you served each one when you gave your life. Thank you, Father, for what you did. Go with us now with the hope rooted in the communion we have with you and with each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.